I'm Will also, and I'm an architect. As part of my work, I spend a lot of time in my car, traveling from place to place. Like you, I don't like a lot of what I see. Cheap and nasty, horrid, revolting, evil, complete and utter shit. But it doesn't have to be that way. And if I had my way, it won't be. In this series, I'm going to show you three extraordinary new cities emerging along the nation's motorways and highways. I think they're the future, and I've got some plans that will make them even better. So come and join me on a journey to discover Britain's super cities. Today we're going on the first of our journeys along the spine of the M62 from Liverpool to Hull. And I'll just program that into the computer. It's 130 miles long and in a strip 20 miles deep live 15.4 million people. It's the first of our super cities and I call it coast to coast. The traditional idea of a city usually grew up around a port or a river or marketplace, around trade routes. But today, cities are no longer so dependent on a particular point of geography. If possible, make a U-turn. With information technology and greater mobility, the way people live has changed. Consequently, many cities have lost their historical sense of identity. But I believe that this identity can be reinvented by being part of a much larger entity by belonging to the super city. Oh, here we are at the pierhead in Liverpool. I suppose in many people's minds it's exemplified by these three iconic buildings. There's three graces. There's the Liver building, Cunard building, and the Port Authority building. And in many people's minds, particularly if they're not from Liverpool, this is Liverpool. And beyond is the Albert Dock. But between the Port Authority building and the Albert Dock, there is a gap. I've been commissioned to build an extraordinary building here. Known locally as the Fourth Grace, it will have a hotel, fabulous shops, and a magnificent public garden on the roof. It will also house a museum of Liverpool to celebrate the city's nomination as Europe's capital of culture in 2008 and act as the western gateway to coast to coast. When I was one that originally I sort of wondered whether we actually needed a fourth grace, but I think, you know, looking ahead to 2008 with the capital of culture, I think the city needs sort of iconic statements and beacon statements. That's one of the um, great things about living, living in this city. You kind of grow up with all that heritage. And what the heritage is really about is confidence. And I think a new fourth grace actually will hopefully sort of fit in with that as well, you know, and say to people that, you know, come back to Liverpool, you know, you know we're confident again. Nowhere is Liverpool's architectural heritage more visible than on the Dock Road. It seems clear that this was once a very wealthy city as more and more spectacular old buildings come up for sale. This is the Stanley Dock, it's a tobacco warehouse. And when it was first built, it was the largest brick building in the world. It's an extraordinary place. And of course, none of it is used. What I would do is convert this into apartments with public space on the ground floor for everyone to enjoy. But I have a sneaking suspicion that some developers might have other ideas. Coming up on the right is an old warehouse that they've converted into living. And it's like a gated community. Nasty, horrid. That represents my worst fear for the whole of this uh, dock road. 
when that rather tasteful sort of yuppie type development takes place, it destroys the whole spirit. And what I enjoy is, uh, I, I, like, I want people to be here to shop and to drink and to use the place, but I don't want it to change its uh, character. I and mean, we can put new buildings in, that's part of the point. And they should be fantastic new buildings. But it's about seeing the people when they're using it. It shouldn't be cut off from the world. I think it's very cynical. Every village, town and city in coast to coast should celebrate its uniqueness rather than undermine it. We need to create confidence in this whole swathe across the country. No longer can cities exist on their own. They depend on each other. For instance, Liverpudlians often travel to Manchester for a night out. Mancunians will go to Bradford for a really good curry, and people from Bradford use the excellent market in Doncaster. One day, people from Hull might even come to Liverpool to visit the Fourth Grace. Who knows? The point is that the drive from coast to coast takes no longer than from one side of London to the other. Actually, probably less. Now, we're just approaching the actual beginnings of the uh, M62. And of course, this is the backbone of coast to coast. It's the lifeblood. It's this piece of tarmac that actually allows people or gives people the connection between all these different places. Yeah, we're just um, going off at Junction 9 to visit uh, Ikea, basically a large shed in the middle of nowhere. But of course, in Super City, it's not in the middle of nowhere, it's the middle of somewhere. To lots of planners and urban designers and architects, these are the places which they love to hate. In actual fact, it's reputedly the most visited building in the whole of the Northwest. How far did you come to do your shop today? From Manchester. From Manchester. To Stoke on Trent. Is that where you live? Yeah. Just south of Birmingham from Solihull. Where's Chorley? That way. Ten miles. Ten miles? Yes. From Manchester? Yeah. Originally from Dublin. Originally from Dublin? Yeah. People like doing these things, therefore it can't all be wrong. Now, what I would like to do with these is not to put them anywhere else, I think they're in the right places. And of course it contributes to the whole idea of the linear city um, extremely well. But actually to upgrade the whole experience, that the parking becomes fantastic, that there is some cover when, it, when, it, when it's raining, that there are some other things to do, there's beautiful gardens, you could relax, you can make a real day out here. And that the architecture itself, the actual building, should be a beautiful building. Here is a beautiful building, 25 kilometers down the M62 in Salford. It is Daniel Liebskin's Imperial War Museum of the North. The interesting thing is it is built of similar materials to IKEA, albeit in a different color. And together with Wilford's Lowry Center opposite has helped put Salford on the map. In the context of coast to coast, our super city, these two buildings between them are very, very important because coast to coast needs points of reference. It needs these iconic pieces of architecture, these places of learning and experiencing and culture, and I wouldn't exclude sport within that, uh, where people can gather because within coast to coast, we need to have tourism for the 15.4 million people inside the city itself, and that's absolutely a critical element of it. Points of high energy where people can gather and ex have different experiences. I think that's absolutely critical. At the roundabout, straight on. Left turn ahead. At the next roundabout, take the third exit. Now here's a rash of offices that you basically call B1 office. Whenever you hear the term B1, it's a planning term, it means that it's always crap. Salford is part of Greater Manchester, and Manchester is a great success story. 
through a combination of cultural innovation and enterprising development, it has grown into one of the country's most desirable places to live and visit. New buildings like Ian Simpson's Urbis Centre rub shoulders with grand old classics like Waterhouse's fabulous Town Hall. Manchester undoubtedly acts as a magnet in the super city, but even here, there is something that has to be addressed. The problem of urban sprawl. The whole point was to take some of the old sprawl, which is very often very low quality houses, and to allow that to decay, just knock them down, and to intensify the existing centres and to add new points, new centres, new villages, um, new towns perhaps, all the way across Super City. So we've climbed out of Manchester and we're now more or less on the top of the Pennines. What this really represents within the city is an extraordinary park, uh, which is accessible to everyone that lives in coast to coast. What we do need to do is to have more uh, exits and entrances onto the highway. And maybe some beautiful sort of rural service area at this particular point, why not? Our prime responsibility as urbanists, planners, architects, designers is to make sure that everyone smiles and has a deep sense of joy when they go to bed every night. Now we're well into Yorkshire now and we've been driving for a while so I'm going to drop in to uh, use the facilities at this service area. Here we are. Could be any motorway, could be any service station. They're all the same and they're all crap. A bad cup of coffee, an uncomfortable bed, and a yucky breakfast. Not much joy here. In the super city, there would be fantastic food, unbelievable shops, and a decent hotel. Of course, Many people pull into these places to avoid the traffic jams that affect all motorways. But given the state of our rail system at the moment, there is no viable alternative to the road. So I have a radical solution. Imagine if we took all the cars off the motorways, leaving only freight. Replace them with luxury high-speed coaches that stop at these service stations at regular intervals. Connect them to the minor roads, increase the parking capacity, and this could become a wonderful park and ride facility to service the coast-to-coast -coast traveler. I think one of the things you have to think very hard about is actually creating a brand that people have a visual image of so they could have a, an emotive association with what that linear city would be. At the moment, there's a very strong and passionate association with the brand of Liverpool, the brand of Leeds, the brand of York, the brand of Manchester. How then would you create a brand that actually people had a very clear vision of something they could easily understand themselves, that they belong to that entity? That's think, quite hard I think to that's do. right, but I think people already operate as if it is one economic certainly. being. Yeah. And, and I know, certainly in my own experience, I'm as like to shop in Manchester as in Leeds, I go to the theatre in Manchester and Leeds, mm -hmm. that all of those are options. I happen to live quite near the middle. I, you know, look at the future of Bradford and how pivotal that's going to be in building this, this whole concept of the coast-to-coast -coast city. I think it's a really strong idea, and I don't think that people have any obstacles, any sort of um, historical obstacles to thinking in that way and operating in that way. They're doing it now. How often have you found a fantastic spot of countryside and thought, I'd love to live just here, if only I could get the planning permission? In Coast to Coast, you could build what you liked, better still, whatever I liked, but development would be confined to an area no more than 10 miles either side of the motorway. Beyond that, we would preserve the wilderness, but within that strip, we could build extraordinary new villages that would deal with the ever-present need for new housing. This village should have a large area on top, maybe of glass, 
where all the rich bastards live with what untold views. And then you have the beautiful people living on single volume on different levels, these lily pads inside. And everyone gets a view out over these marvelous fields and then some communal areas, you know, the church, the church very important, the, 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 the parish church, some shops, eating, things like this. And all of this sits on legs to allow this wonderful agricultural landscape to run underneath it. And the whole thing is about maybe 25, 30 stories high, taking a fraction of the space, a fraction of the space that the sort of developer urban sprawl merchants occupy. Very ecological. Not bad. about playing it's not about having preconceptions not being not being programmed by somebody else's sense of what things should be and you find urban designers who are working in this area now they talk they have a particular language they talk about public space they talk about avenues they talk about boulevards they talk about rediscovering the street all of which are probably very valid things to do, and I, I know why they say it. And it also con it conjures up the image of a city that we all know. And I'm interested in the city that we don't know. One of the most familiar sites in our towns and cities all over the country is the ubiquitous out-of-town shopping centre. This is Meadow Hall near Sheffield, better known to some as Merry Hell. It is huge, extremely popular, and absolutely lethal to the economy of towns around it, like Barnsley. Here we are in the thriving shopping centre of Barnsley. There are very few people here, very few people here. So, where are they? In Meadow Hall in Sheffield. So they've sucked the life out of this place. What Barnsley needs is to completely reinvent itself rather than try and compete with places like Meadow Hall. Having been asked to master plan a vision for its future, I see Barnsley as a Tuscan hill town with its very own 21st century inhabited town wall. In this case, not for protection, but for identity. This vision is also about a way of life, the quality of eating, the pace of life, and the relationships between people of all different ages. This is what we should be aiming for, rather than another high street stuffed with chain stores. What Coast to Coast needs is hundreds of different hotspots, centers and meeting places, each one absolutely unique. Hopefully by this Christmas, coming from the top of the tower on the town hall, we'll have installed a very special new type of light which will emit a halo over downtown Barnsley, a kilometre in diameter which symbolizes the inhabited wall that will contain the center of Barnsley going into the future. The last leg of Coast to Coast lies in the vast agricultural plains of Yorkshire and Lincolnshire, en route to the North Sea. This is the least developed part of the super city and in many ways the most problematic. Oh, I love this silo, it's a coke silo. Coke to burn, that is. This is the port of uh, Immingham. Ironically, this is the largest port in Britain, and it's right at uh, the eastern end on the Humber estuary of our coast to coast city. Of course, at one time, Liverpool was far larger, and this port didn't exist at all. And now it's completely reversed, we're facing Europe and all sorts of things come in and out. The value of these things is enormous. And sadly, not a great deal of that money finds its way into the pockets of the people who work here. The few workers there are mostly come from nearby Grimsby. Once a thriving fishing port, Grimsby is now blighted by poor housing and economic decline. The wealthy port authority that runs Immingham appears to have little interest in helping regenerate the area that serves it. So what can be done? 
Well, one solution would be to create a fantastic new town right here in the port of Immingham. This could provide work for the local community and attract people to the whole region. There should be people living here, some shops, some other things. You imagine having, a, having your hair done with a view of ships coming and going. It'd be extraordinary. So potentially one of the real hotspots in our coast-to-coast -coast city. We're deep in estuary country now, the eastern estuary of uh, coast to coast. And we're just approaching uh, the Humber Bridge. And I think it's sad that they put extremely conventional lampposts down the middle of it, as though it could be just any street. This is a special street. We're way up in the air, going over water. They should have thought about the lighting. We are now in Hull, the eastern anchor of coast to coast, and good though it is, it can't quite compare with Liverpool at the western end. Of course, this is a major conflict. No single city should dominate another. What we are after is a chain of singularly extraordinary points, all the way from the Mersey to the Humber, and Hull is no exception. But I've been told there is a new building here, which is proving to be a great attraction. The deep. Oh, Was I being stupid? At the end of the road, turn right. Oh, this is extremely confusing. We'll find it. If you tell me where the deep is, you know how to get to the deep. Here we are at the end of our journey through coast to coast. And this is where the city starts to dissolve into the North Sea, where the form of the estuary actually tries to embrace the whole of that sea and indeed the whole of Western Europe beyond. It needs a punctuation mark. It needs something that will serve to attract people and to mark the end of our city. And we have it in the form of the deep. The deep is, in fact, an aquarium. It was designed by Terry Farrell and it was put here as an attractor, and certainly from being here, even for the last half hour, we've had two hen parties who have been photographed against it. There's another film crew that wants to make a film. So it's obviously highly successful. We see how even though we're talking about a huge city that houses a very large number of people, that the architecture of some of the smallest things compared with the size of the whole city are of great importance to give a sense of identity and individuality. Of course, there's still a lot of work to be done before this super city fulfills its potential. But I believe that the building blocks are already in place and that with a little imagination and vision, coast to coast could become a truly exceptional and unbelievable place to live. In next week's program, we will visit our second great super city, which runs from Birmingham to London, down the infamous M6 and the first motorway to be built, the M1. I call it Diagonale. I'm Will Alsop, and I'm an architect. As part of my work, I spend a lot of time in my car, traveling from place to place. And I'm like you. I don't like a lot of what I see. Cheap and nasty, horrid, revolting, evil, complete and utter shit. What I would do is to reinvent our towns and cities by linking them together in extended communities. In fact, it's already beginning to happen. And in this program, 
I want to show you an extraordinary new city creeping along the M1, M6 corridor. 130 miles long with a population of 20 million people. It is Britain's biggest super city and it's under construction. Here we are in Birmingham, England's second city. It's one end of our super city, stretching down the M6 and the M1 to London. And I call it the Diagon Alley. Birmingham has always played second fiddle to cosmopolitan London, but as the northern gateway to Diagon Alley, this will no longer be the case. The two cities would come together as anchor points in the extended super city. It's well serviced by a vast network of road and rail arteries, and people already regularly commute between Birmingham and London and all the towns in between. Soon, there'll be a train that can get you to Euston in half an hour. So what we need here is a big architectural statement to set the agenda. Birmingham, at the end of our super city, is like a, an anchor store. And in the heart of this fairly compact city centre, it's quite traditional, you have New Street Station, just down here, which is possibly one of the worst stations, the worst car parks and the worst shopping centre on top of it that exists in Christendom. Now, what sort of place is that to act as this major anchor store in our super city? Birmingham was meant to be Britain's version of Los Angeles, the city of the car. The motorway comes virtually straight into the town centre. The idea was that you drove everywhere. So they built a lot of roads, they built a lot of car parks, and of course, they built a lot of new buildings. It was a huge urban experiment. All of this, where we're driving now, was built in the early 60s. And I remember being bought here, and um, it, was a, it was extraordinary. It was all new. It was a sort of brave new world. It was absolutely amazing. I couldn't believe it. The new station, the shopping centre, the rotunda, these buildings here. I still like these buildings here, but most of it, of course, it was unfortunate that it was built at a bad time for British architecture. There wasn't really the confidence or quite the imagination. And uh, so as a result of that, they got it wrong. Non-stop traffic and terrible architecture has turned Birmingham into Britain's most maligned city. Now they're trying to reinvent it. They pedestrianise the city centre, they're rerouting the roads and building Europe's largest shopping development here, the new Bullring. This includes Selfridges, a building which is designed to make a big impact. I'm standing here behind the Bullring shopping centre and behind me over there is one of the first icons of post-war Birmingham, which is the Rotunda, which I personally like a lot and I remember it when it was first built. Over here, of course, is the latest icon, not quite finished. It's Selfridges by Future Systems, and we're going to find out what people think about it. It's not my style. I prefer somewhere like St Martin's, but um, mm -hmm. I can tolerate it. Do you like it? Yes. Good. Do you like it better than that one? The Rotunda? Oh, the Rotunda. Yeah, definitely, yeah. You don't like the Rotunda? Well, it's, it's decrepit, it's old. I mean, it's they're going to refurbish it, though. They're going to refurbish it? Uh, yeah, it's going to become flats. You can move in there. I wouldn't want to live in the centre of Birmingham. Selfridges is meant to be an iconic building designed by Amanda Levitt of Future Systems. Amanda, are you happy that it's uh, called an iconic building? Well, I, I think the term iconic is quite a hackneyed phrase, but I mean, I think it's quite apt in, in this instance. It's interesting that when we came in to Birmingham station this morning that it's already being used on an ad for Barclays. It's become part of the public domain. It's not a public building, but if you look at the number of people that pass through it, it's a far greater number than pass through the Tate Modern or the British Museum. So it begins to question the nature of a public building. We're in the centre of the Bullring, in the new shopping centre. And it, for me, it's very interesting because what you find behind me now is the inside of Selfridges poking through into the centre. 
And there you have the sort of a suggestion of a very interesting piece of architecture. And behind me, you have actually not very interesting architecture. In fact, it's completely horrid. And they've broken it down into a sort of little medieval street. It's not even a new idea, not a new concept, not like Selbridge. Why couldn't they have all the architects here of the same quality as the architects doing Selfridges? I don't understand. The new bullring is now open for business, and the early signs are that it's proving very popular. But 500 metres down the road is another new building which tells a different story. Birmingham Science Museum, Millennium Point, is also designed by a pioneering architect, Nicholas Grimshaw. It has a prominent location, public square outside, huge atrium in the middle. All the right planning boxes have been ticked, and in every sense, this should be a signature building. But no one wants to go there. Why? Well, they designed the building first and then decided what to do with it. Now, to me, that's the wrong way round. Ten miles down the M6 in Walsall, they got it right with this award-winning art gallery. Here, in the huge urban sprawl around Birmingham, I've been asked to master plan the redevelopment of the adjacent canal. What I'm doing first is to consult the public. If you work asking people what they think and you get them to draw and them to talk about their ideas and thoughts about their town, what you discover is that they are interestingly mad. And if you do the normal form of consultation, which is why the civil servants like to tick all the, all the bloody boxes, then you don't get anything creative at all. You get, oh, we'd like some housing. Uh, no, we don't want an art gallery because we, could spend, we should spend that money on the hospital. You know, we're all sick. Well, to here, I've not heard any mention of, oh, this is a waste of money. Is that, oh, we'd like a theatre. Can we do a theatre? And can we have a space for funny performances? And can we do this? And can we do that? So it's like adding to this what I call urban soup. And of course, in relating that to the sort of bigger picture of our linear cities, our super cities, then it should all be like that. It should be this sort of extraordinary goulash which you can sort of dip into and you don't know what you're going to find. And spatially, it should be extraordinary. And these people we've been working with here today didn't let me down at all. You know, it proves my point absolutely that this is how you go about thinking about a town, a city, or a nation. Neighbouring West Bromwich, I'm building a new arts complex after two years of working with the local community. It will be a space to meet, tell stories and make art. This is my version of a public building and maybe one day this will become a major attraction in Diagonale. Heading south on the M6 there is an entertainment complex which is already a major attraction. At night Star City looks like a mini outpost of Las Vegas and in the context of the super city, this might serve as a model of what a motorway development might be like. This has the potential to be a real hotspot in Diagonale, but I've yet to see it up close. In order to get there, we have to come off the M6 on this uh, very famous intersection called Spaghetti Junction. It's a marvelous network of roads that duck and dive and weave their way over each other. And of course, driving on Spaghetti Junction is just magnificent. Here we are at Star City. And I have to say, this is perhaps the biggest heap of shit I've seen almost anywhere. They've dumped this down in the middle of nowhere which isn't so bad in the context of the super city if you really thought about it, and it was an icon, a true, iconic, wonderful piece of architecture. But you would never lump all these things together. There are references like the rotunda on the roof to the Staats Gallery in Stuttgart. There are references, to sort of classical references to the dome shape. There are 
funny uses of colour and stripes, a sort of pattern notion, it's a sort of interior design come to the outside. I find this utterly depressing. If this was built in Las Vegas, it would be closed within a week. It's not up to it. There's no invention here, it's just... I'm angry about it. I think it's just... I'm speechless. We've joined the M1 and gone to Coventry. What I want to show you here is my idea of an iconic building and that it needn't be new. Coventry Cathedral was designed in the 1950s next to the ruins of the old cathedral, which was raised to the ground during the war. The quality of this building is extraordinary. It's obviously built to last. Well, very often you hear people talking in planning committees and they talk about this idea of not blending in. You hear it time and time again, oh, it doesn't blend in. And I don't know what that means because you know, clearly Victorian architecture didn't blend in with Georgian architecture. And the whole point is if you have high quality design from any period, you can put it cheek by jowl and, and, and it works extremely well. Where you attempt to blend in or to make some sort of reference to the past, and it's clearly there's no evidence of a reference here between the new cathedral and the old cathedral. If you try to make this cathedral have a reference to the original architecture, this would be terrible. It would not work at all because everyone would know it's some sort of pastiche. People are not stupid. They will be attracted to quality, to excitement, to quality of experience, and they'll travel for miles and miles to do that. I was brought here as a child, and it was very important to me because one of the stories I was told by my parents, who lived in Northampton, is that on the night that Coventry was bombed and the original cathedral was destroyed, you could see Coventry burning from Northampton, which is about 40 miles away. And uh, therefore, that there's an image particularly locks in the in, in mind of a six or seven year old. You can't imagine that, You're seeing a fire, a whole city on fire from that sort of distance, and therefore it was very powerful. And I've always felt that it had some sort of meaning for me, this place. Now we're getting uh, closer to Northampton, and this bridge coming up, I remember extremely well. It was on this bridge, I remember standing looking at the traffic and look with my father. Um, and traffic watching was very popular. But I was standing there, we had a picnic in a field over there. And the next day, he died. So it's one of the last memories of my father was um, standing on the bridge. Very related to this sort of great highway. Northampton is where I grew up, and this is one of those places where anyone with any ambition wants to run away from. To many, including the government's urban task force, it is located in the middle of nowhere, but in diagonally, towns like these would be given a new sense of identity by being part of a larger entity, the super city. To attract new people to this area, we should build new villages in between these towns and create 21st century communities here. There are large areas of the um, super city where there is not very much except countryside. And because these are the places that we can begin to think about absorbing new activities and, uh, and, and new places to live. And they can, of course, take the form of almost singular buildings. In this particular view here, it's possible to have a cluster of these this is the place where people can live and there can be recreation in the form of fitness and swimming pools. But of course, because these things are sitting very lightly and gently on the landscape, it does mean that we haven't destroyed the landscape. And in fact, you could say it improves this landscape.
very soon we'll be arriving in a small village called Grafton Regis, um, again in the heart of, uh, of the Diagonale, where I hope we'll find somewhere where I can get a little sustenance. The White Heart. Fantastic. I think we'll just pull in here and see if we can get some cottage pie. I'm sitting on my left with Jean, on my right is Cathy, and opposite me is Alan. Now, you don't exactly agree with my idea of this being the heart of, the, of this super city, which I call the Diagonale. I think it's a dreadful idea. It's an absolute terrible idea. You're going to take away all the countryside and just make it even, even busier. You're going to lose community spirit. And if you're going to absorb more villages into your super city, that's going to make the remaining villages more attractive and put up the price of housing even further. And that's going to drive out the local people who are really interested in what goes on in these communities. I think that the super cities would increase the number of people wanting to get out of them into the countryside. Already in villages, local people cannot afford to buy their own houses. It requires to say, Jean, that um, by creating new villages here, which actually don't destroy the identity of this one, but there'd be very nice villages and people could live there, and they'd wake up to a view. But in many, many of those urban um, dwellers, if I put it, um, that's, what that's why they'd like to be in the country. They'd like to wake up to a better view than they wake up to at the moment. And I'm sure we can all relate to that as an ambition. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I'm not saying that it's wall-to-wall -wall urbanism. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that the farms become a part of the city. Why not branch out elsewhere where it's less populated and, and build new cities or new populations in those areas and, and make those areas more accessible. Are you right. saying not in my backyard? Yes, no, I think I'm... we're all actually saying well, that to yeah. a degree. <laughs> Too yes, many people are moving into the villages who so aren't actually attached would to them. increase the number of people wanting to get out of plants and not going to be able to spread. They're going to be trapped away because of the fruits on what we've already got and close the gates yes. and stop letting others in in the first place. Well, it's a wonderful nap after lunch. Here we are in this sort of rural idyll, sitting under a walnut tree on a perfect circular bench where lovers make tris, carve their names in the tree. Village Green, the church behind me. Now, I want to show you what the people that live in these sorts of places are really worried about by the, from the likes of me, the architect. And look, adjacent to that beautiful village is this. Executive housing, I think they might call this. This is Milton Keynes. As you can see, the new town has overwhelmed the original village called Milton Keynes, which has all but disappeared. In the super city, this wouldn't be allowed to happen. We should preserve the identity of the old and build new towns with brand new identities. We would build fabulous modern houses like these and bring bold new architecture to the countryside. Why not? To all intents and purposes, Milton Keynes is a brand new town. Like Birmingham, it was built to be totally car friendly. But unlike Birmingham, this experiment worked and people liked living here. In fact, there are plans to extend the town across the M1 so that it becomes an even stronger presence right in the middle of Diagon Alley. I'm all for that. What's more, Wimbledon Football Club have just moved their home 70 miles up the M1 to this location, further proof that the super city is fast becoming a reality. The M1, of course, in the future, as the Diagon Alley develops, is really our high street. And one begins to speculate as to whether it should actually have a name, you know, like Arcasia Avenue, Woodvale, all those special names. But whether M1 is personal enough to be the main street in our new city. 
We'll have to think about that. I think what's happened with the M25 is that it's become what the old, dirty, working Thames used to be. It's now the great river and lifeline of London. You know, these Eddie Stobart lorries are the equivalent of the kind of barges that used to go up and down the river. But what about the structure itself? I, I'm quite attracted to the structure itself. It has a kind of elegance, curvature. I suppose it's very Ballardian. It's very much J.G. Ballard's idea of the, the cathedrals of the future. I think within the super city, these places will be very special and they'll be places that people make expeditions to see. The last leg of our journey takes us past London on the M25. London, of course, is in the process of constant expansion, and this is where Diagonale is pushing its way through the Thames Corridor toward the sea. Just to the east of Canary Wharf, and we're going past the dome, you can see this is London struggling to move east, and this is the actual natural extension for the Diagonale. And here in this area, which I, which I quite like because it's sort of an itinerant area, it's got bits of new stuff, new housing, old stuff, and it's a real rag bag. And in this super city, this extended long city, there would inevitably be areas which you can't define as country or town or city. They are bits. And I think the bits are very interesting. This is the Ford car plant. Even though it's designed purely for function, it is still one of the most interesting buildings in this area. The destination is ahead. South End, near the end of Diagon Alley. Descending down, we see the Thames Estuary in front of us, looking across to Kent on the other side. You can't quite see Birmingham from here, I wish you could. But here in South End, the logical creep of London to the southeast, this is the end of Diagon Alley. But what a fantastic end, an iconic structure, a pier, a mile and a quarter long, the longest pier in the world. These are the sort of things that we want all throughout our super cities. What we're after is the perfect balance between work and play, urban and rural, the sacred, and of course the profane, is all there. So let's join it together and bring on the brave new world. In next week's programme, we shall visit our third and final super city, 140 miles long from Hastings to Poole on the English Riviera. I call it WAVE. marks the edge of our third super city. We're in Hastings, and that is the English Channel. <laughs> 140 miles in that direction is Poole, and in between we have Hove, Brighton, Littlehampton, Worthing, Southampton, Bournemouth, and many other settlements. Together, they form our super city along this coastline, and we call it Wave. Even though virtually every last inch of Wave is developed in one form or another, there has never been any overall vision to bring all the different towns and resorts together into a vibrant community. This is where the idea of the super city can help to coordinate all the elements into a whole. Fantastic climate, 
extraordinary landscape and the promise of the sea makes this the pleasure playground of England. This is where we come for the perfect day out, or a beach holiday, or even a mucky weekend. Why not? I'll tell you why not, because virtually the whole of Wave is plagued by everything that is cheap and nasty. Amusement arcades, rancid B&Bs, and the all-day breakfast yuck. To put it bluntly, Wave is a mess, and Hastings is no exception. Hastings is the 27th most deprived town in the country. Holiday patterns changed. People didn't come here for two weeks' holiday. We were always at the end of the line, transport-wise. And we've now, after a, a, a lot of pressure, convinced central government, regional agencies that there is need in the southeast and there's need in Hastings. Hastings might be on the verge of regeneration, but first it needs some decent roads to join it up to other places you might want to visit. But in Wave, this is not as simple as it might seem. We're on our way to see Jenny Yeo, who lives in Crowhurst, which is a small place just uh, inland from Hastings. And she's very concerned at the proposed new road, which of course could turn out to be the lifeblood for Hastings and contribute to some of that regeneration. They are proposing to put a link road from Bexhill to Hastings through this valley, right across coming up here and right through practically demolishing my stables. It is going to ruin several farms, as you can imagine. I think I'm right in saying that the proposed route mm -hmm. is about 10 miles, and you, rather cleverly, have, um, uh, have proposed an alternative route, which is about five miles. Correct. Half the expense, half the distance, half the pollution. Correct. That's on the other side of the valley, which wouldn't affect the valley in taking roughly the line of the old railway on the other side of the valley over there. Have you ever been called a NIMBY, i.e. not in my backyard? Not as far as I know, no, I don't think so, because there are so many other people, other than the people that live in Crowhurst and the surrounding valleys, that, are, that enjoy this valley. What we learn from this is that individuals can sometimes arrive at better solutions than the planners. More roads, more connection, more life, more people, and more opportunity to enjoy driving down these super highways in our super cities. Well, we can certainly see as we're crawling down this hill towards Bexhill exactly why the new link road is required. And we're all starving, we're all waiting for lunch, and we've got five kilometers to go and I think the chef will have gone home by the time we get there. You see that as we come down this hill, they're obviously not very proud of the sea because they've completely blocked it off. So the very reason that people come here, which is the coast, the sea, the ozone, they prevent you seeing it. How extraordinary. Despite the short-sightedness of the planners and developers here, Bexhill is still one of the real architectural hotspots in Wave because of this building, an Art Deco masterpiece. I'm sitting in front of the Delaware Pavilion in Bexhill, this building behind me is one of the icons of the 1930s architecture. It's designed by Mendelssohn and Schermitter in 1935 and was constructed to complete the idea of a day out. It's a building of tremendous optimism. It's a fantastic building. It's interesting for us to ask the question, why are there not more buildings like this built not only along the south coast, but anywhere else for that matter? And because something happened, I believe, in the war, which meant we had to reinvent the notion of architecture, and we forgot the threads as to where architecture was going prior to the war. If I was king of the world, I'd line up all the architects since the Second World War and shoot them. Well, and I'd be a dead man. <laughs> You're aware that it's, a, it's an important piece of architecture in, oh, yes, in historical yes, terms? Oh, yes, very much so, yes. And do you like it? Yes, it's very nice, yes. There's not many places like this about. 
I work in London and the stuff that's going on now, being put up on the South Bank, it's just ruining the skyline and completely out of proportion with existing buildings. There's lovely old churches that are being dwarfed by dreadful orange tiled buildings on the... Yeah, who did that one? You? No, who? Richard Rogers. Was it? Yeah, wow. And I think the other one you're referring to is slightly bulbous looking yeah, building. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, who did the... Yeah, who designed that? No. Norman Foster. But I was about to say Foster, he can't even build a bridge, can he? Never mind a building. <laughs> I'll tell him. <laughs> you do that. <laughs> You give a knife fix an opportunity to create something special for this place, and particularly for this place, it would never turn out like this bungalow. It's done without any wit or passion, and yet they live in an extraordinarily beautiful place that actually exudes passion. They're in the right place, but in the wrong physical containers. Here we are in a fantastic fantastic beach which sweeps around to the headland towards Eastbourne and this is exactly the sort of place where you'd like to live at least I would so how could it be maybe there are several ways maybe you could have some extraordinary sort of giant pebble actually floats maybe even moves goes up and down a little bit with the tide tethered to the shore if you're going for a walk along this beach, where would you stop? Why would you turn around? You need points of destination. And we could have maybe pebbles, and everyone has extraordinary sort of balconies here. And behind is where you put all the bathrooms and the lavatories. No, why not? We should have lavatories here on the front. A lavatory with a view. Maybe this should just be some extraordinary glass with sort of hanging gardens in here. So when you get bored with the view of the sea, you can have a view back inland. I'd live there. And so would a thousand other people. What a spectacular place to build. The real point about building like that a lot on the beach is that you don't destroy any of the stuff that we're driving through now. You know, the sort of wind-bent hedges and trees, the sort of meadowland here, it's all there. And all you see is one or two wonderful things, designed by me, of course. Rise up towards Beachy Head. It reminds me very much of the road leading up the hill from Camiore to Padona in Tuscany having a nice cool beer at the top. I doubt that we'll find a place for a nice cool beer at the top of this climb. And if there is one up here on Beachy Head, you can bet your life that it's half-hearted, temporary lump of turd. This is, of course, an infamous suicide spot. I don't know why, because this place is as moving and inspiring as anywhere we've visited on our journey. Looking down, we can see that up to this point, Wave is a virtually unbroken strip of development. In fact, things look better from up here than they do from down there. But the most important thing is that we can see here, particularly in the evening light, that people are playing with the water. There are kites, there are people walking, dog walking. And it's the actual physical quality of Wave which gives it its appeal. Isn't that beautiful? Wonderful beaches and valleys. This is Saltbean, just outside Brighton. What happened here is symbolic of everything that is wrong with Wave. There was nothing here until the 30s when a forward-thinking modernist community was planned, a brave new world. First they built the magnificent Lido at the bottom of the hill, and then the Grand Hotel at the top. They built one or two Art Deco houses, and then inevitably something went wrong. And this rash of bog-standard housing was allowed to be developed in between. Today, the hotel is a place for old-age pensioners' package tours, and the Lido is for the lone, intrepid swimmer. 
nothing else stirs is enough to chill your blood. So what should a modern seaside development be like? Perhaps we'll find some answers here at Brighton Marina, which was built in the 70s and 80s. Some lucky residents have a sea view, but what about the public areas where the shops and restaurants are? People actually got quite excited about this place when it was built. Here they have invested vast sums of money to capture a bit of the, of, of the ocean so that boats can lie in there and all these bars can't see the boats, can't see the sea. Casino, Pizza Hut at the other end, the David Lloyd Health and Fitness Club. What's wrong with running up and down the beach here? This is the marina. I haven't seen a boat yet. And this is quite frankly just bad design. Oh look, I can see the masts of one or two yachts. Yippee. This place has got all the quality of a skid mark down a laboratory pan. I can find nothing good to say about this. This actually gives new meaning to the word disappointment. Time to go. Brighton is the hottest of the hot spots, as things exist at the moment anyway, in, in the length of the wave. This is a place that you actually want to be. Of course, Brighton has a reputation for high living and dirty weekends. Nothing wrong with that. At least it has a unique charm. Now there are plans to make it even bigger and better. The first phase includes four skyscrapers on the seafront designed by the American architect, Frank Geary. We think that's the right kind of concept for this place, which will really revitalize the seafront here. I want to make a statement, a statement which is as dramatic and exciting as was the Royal Pavilion in its day. And do you think um, Frank's proposals are going to be well received by the people of Brighton? Well, inevitably there's division, isn't there? Very, if you're very, very local to it, then you're concerned. But I think it's capturing the imagination of the city as a whole, and people want to make that kind of statement, and they want something which is unbelievably exciting. These are the remains of the ruined West Pier. It's been a wreck for over 10 years and was recently set on fire by unknown arsonists. If you're a town that's known for two piers and one is destroyed, what's the best way to get over that bad publicity? It's to build a third pier, of course. And uh, instead of going out to sea, we should build one that's horizontal to the shore. Let's build another waterfront, which we happen to call a pier. Let's make it into a town, mixed use. Places full of desire to raise the spirit and to help put this hot spot in wave really on the map. It'd be fascinating to sit here on the beach, even just looking out. It's an extraordinary new town. Hello, rain. Well, that goes well with this rather depressing spot. We see that we go from the grandeur of the seafront at Brighton and when we go through this industrial zone and we find our way emerging into death row. This is the image of the south coast that many people in the rest of England have. Small bungalows occupied by people who are waiting to die. We don't want ghettos of any one type of person, be it by age, creed, or income bracket. The priceless quality of wave is that the sea air and this landscape has a revitalizing effect on everyone. This is what we, as architects and planners, should be exploiting. We need to build vibrant new buildings and attractions here that can make this super city the country's center of recreation. Maybe then people might give up the Costa del Sol and come here to Bogna Regis for their holidays. Holidays are a very important part of one's life. So you can reflect on what you're doing, where you might be going. You can allow to have dreams. And therefore one of the roles for WAVE 
is to provide an extraordinary place that will feed all those dreams. We're now on the M27 heading west. This small stretch of road is the only motorway in Wave, and as we have seen, the chances of extending this to serve as the lifeblood of the super city is, to put it mildly, remote. Of course, what we do have here is the sea, and maybe this is where we should be looking for our connective link, be it boat, hovercraft, or even monorail. After all, right in the middle of Wave is Southampton, where the sea serves as a major gateway to the world. Thank you. Southampton uh, was bombed very badly in the war, and it started to rebuild itself at a very sad time for British architecture. And the scars are uh, still with us. You can get hints of how it used to be, and then you get complete architectural conceits that falls into what we call the atrocious right category. How did that get planning permission? Beautiful new car park. Level 15. fantastic piece of water with giant bits of metal floating up and down, coming in from all over the world. There's a sense of romance, and what do they do? Nothing. They allow a park, which very few people go to, to remain. It's cut off from anyone else by a dual carriageway. You have a, a revolting, an unbelievably revolting pile of poo, which is the, the hotel. And if I turn to my right over here, which is the West Keys shopping centre, from a design point of view, this is somewhat better. I mean, at least it doesn't offend my eye. You can imagine the conversation here, though, between the designer and the, uh, and, and the client. Well, we're, we're by the harbour, and we're going to make a reference to ships, and it's about prows and sterns and canting pieces of glass, and it's, it's romantic. Then we'll have a, the promenade deck coming around here where you can sit. Unfortunately, between them and the view is this car park. So, oh, that's good, isn't it? And there's gonna be another building there, and there'll be another building behind me here. And so, actually, it's a, it's a beached whale. It's no bloody ship at all. Could be anywhere in the world. And yet, this is the city. Southampton is the city, which is a city all about connections with the world, and then we put everyone inside. Nonsense. This makes me angry. This is St Mary's, once the high street of Southampton. Look at it now. The same council that built Westkey is also responsible for this. What the locals here wanted was money to regenerate this area back into a thriving community with specialist shops and services. What they got was the private development of flats and houses that few of them could afford to live in. Southampton was awarded in the region of 26 million about seven years ago. Uh, which was an exciting prospect for this area and um, it seemed that there was going to be a lot of community involvement which was good news but the powers that be actually wanted to push the shopping in the city west and they seemed to feel that any successful shopping here would threaten that which we, could, we couldn't see how that could happen at all. Surely a very different scale of shopping. It's a totally different shopping experience. Here we had small businesses, we had cafes, you know, people that made things, um, little pet shops and all that now is gone. But you've uh, really showed the way by example, because on Northern Road, uh, you've been responsible for doing up some of the shops and the houses, many of those shops, selling wonderful things, and it's a nice place to be. Yeah, I mean, we feel that was an example. I mean, old Northern Road, which is at the end of St Mary Street, had many more shops closed up. The percentage was fair, far higher than St Mary Street. But we've turned that round and it works really well. What Ian Loveridge has shown us is that in the face of bureaucratic blundering, the will and imagination of individuals can still make a difference. Good for him. We're back on the M27, passing through the New Forest. In Wave, this would be preserved as fabulous parkland. On the western verge of the forest, we reacquaint ourselves with what we came here for in the first place, the sea at Bournemouth. And here, 
a 140 mile super city has a waterfront which is actually detached from the town. You have arrived. And of course, unlike the other beaches, we have a sandy beach here. Now, I'm not saying that this particular road is the best piece of urbanism in the world, but I think it's quite unique. Bournemouth hasn't really begun to address reinventing itself. It's still very old fashioned. We have the beach huts. You could come on a warm winter's day and sit there, make a cup of tea, put on an extra jersey, because the sea is fantastic in the winter too. But I think given its position within WAVE, that if someone here began to think of a really new vision about why people should come here, it wouldn't be hard, because the basic structure of the place is all there. We're now approaching Poole. Poole is Bournemouth's more prosperous neighbour, and some of the architecture and development here is more like what we need throughout WAVE. It's very pleasant. This is California, the south coast. Large houses and all too often now become blocks of flats set away from the road behind private screens of hedges and trees. It has an air of exclusivity about it. If I told you that Frank Sinatra once lived here, you'd believe me. Here we are, the end of our journey. What a fantastic place to end. Overlooking Pool Harbour. What have we discovered? We've discovered that in all three cities there are some very inventive, creative people they have a recognition of the idea of the city, and this is the beginning of a change of perception. And if we can change that perception of where they live, perhaps we can begin to reshape these cities and add to the landscapes and protect landscapes in a completely different way. We found that some people are let down by the aspirations of politicians, but also the private sector. We need better clients. We also found that we need better architects. What we don't need is better people. They're already fantastic. And I have every faith that the super cities will be extraordinary. Tracy, I think I need another drink.